So welcome to our webinar on the abuses of power in spiritual and cultural organizations on behalf of Harvard Divinity School, the Center for the Study of World Religions and the Program for the Evolution of Spirituality. We welcome you to our conversation today. Um, I am joining you from Cambridge on the lands of the Massachusetts people and I have the pleasure of serving as the Assistant Director for the Program for the Evolution of Spirituality. And I'll just say a few words about the program. Um, so the program, a new program here at Harvard Divinity School was created in 2019 to support the scholarly study of emerging spiritual movements, marginalized spiritualities, and the innovative edge of established spiritual traditions. We have a particular mandate to create programming that fully includes people who are personally committed to alternative spiritualities, and that fully includes people who have experienced harm from alternative spiritual communities. This is a delicate balancing act, and we are still learning how to do it. Today's event, which, which centers on the voices of people who have experienced harm, is one part of that balancing act. Next year, we will be sponsoring a larger conference on ecological spiritualities that will continue this conversation and also bring many more voices of current participants in alternative, alternative spiritualities into the conversation. We hope that all of you will be inspired to continue learning from us as our work and with us as our work evolves. So my name is Natalia Schween. I am a second year master's in theological studies student here at Harvard Divinity School, as well as the assistant for the assistant program director for the program for the evolution of spirituality here at HDS. I am also the organizer for Harvard's animism reading group and I am practicing herbalist. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here again. And thank you to the study of world religions here at Harvard Divinity School for co-sponsoring this event. All right, so thank you for joining us um, for our virtual panel on the abuse of power in alternative and spiritual, spiritual and cultural organizations. We understand that this is an extremely complex and sensitive subject. Persons and organizations that abuse power exist on a broad spectrum and it is critical to acknowledge ambiguities and variances in each person's experience. Many of these spaces represent and provide the potential to be greatly empowering for those who have been marginalized or experienced some other form of disempowerment. And abuse of power is not always intentional. Virtually every spiritual path has both positive and negative consequences for its participants. Simultaneously, however, it is equally important to be forthright in naming those lived realities that are unacceptable and to provide spaces for critical discourse and healing. I have the honor of introducing our wonderful panelists today and we are so grateful that they have agreed to join us and to speak about their experiences and share their insights. So please welcome our first panelist, Amber Scora. She is a writer and media activist living in Brooklyn, New York, as well as a master's in theological studies student here at HDS. She is the author of the memoir, Leaving the Witness, published by Viking Books, which documents her life with the Jehovah's Witnesses and her exit from the religion. Our second panelist, Helen Zuman, is the author of Mating in Captivity, a memoir of her five years post-Harvard at Zendik Farm, a cult with a radical take on sex and relationships. The book was published by She Writes Press in 2018 and is sold wherever books are sold. Our third panelist, Margaret Smith, currently holds the position of Director of Trauma, Healing and Community Resistance at the Institute of World, Re World Affairs in Washington, DC. Before becoming an academic, she worked for 17 years with the international NGO Moral Rearmament, now called Initiatives of Change. This group, which was called the Oxford Group in the 1930s, is perhaps best known this, these days because it spawned Alcoholics Anonymous, but it has a long track work, record of Christian-based Christian interfaith reconciliation work on all continents. And finally, Suki Madawi, as a documentary director, writer, and cinematographer based in Denver. Her work can be seen on Netflix, HBO, The New York Times, a &E, Yahoo, and Refinery29. Please find more information about her and her work on her website, which I will post below in the chat, along with links for the other panelists. Suki is a survivor of Nixium, a well-publicized and recently dismantled cult that claimed to be a personal development and marketing company. 
And finally, if you or someone you know has been adversely affected by high control groups or organizations, we encourage you to visit the International Cultic Studies Association's website for support and counseling resources. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. We'll begin with Amber. Thank you. I'll mute myself. Hey, everybody. Uh, just a little intro. Um, I'll first give a background of how I got into the Jehovah's Witness organization. Uh, for me, I was born into the Jehovah's Witnesses religion. Uh, I was third generation. Uh, my parents and grandparents were Jehovah's Witnesses, and almost everyone in my family are Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, I was taught from my earliest memories that the world was ending as a child. Um, I used to have sort of nightmares about Armageddon and whether I was good enough to survive this apocalypse. Um, and we were taught as Jehovah's Witnesses that we were the chosen ones and that only Jehovah's Witnesses would be saved and that anyone who wasn't part of the group would be killed by God in this impending doomsday. So our role in life was to preach and we weren't allowed to go to college and we were um, discouraged from getting a career because uh, what was the point of building a life in this world that was Satan's world and was about to be destroyed. Um, and then the end goal would be we would all live in paradise on earth, just the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, to exit the organization, the process is not easy. It's not the kind of religion where you can just sort of slink out unnoticed. And especially I was very high profile because I was uh, a missionary in mainland China, which was something that um, Jehovah's Witnesses are banned in China. So I worked underground and um, it was highly unusual for someone doing that to leave the group. Um, so when I left, I was branded an apostate, um, shunned by all of the family and friends I had who were in the group, which was basically my whole community. And then uh, because I was in China, I was all alone, no longer had a purpose for being there, nor did I have a career or an education or um, any idea of what to do with my life. And I was already 33 years old. Um, so I, after that, I moved to New York City, but that's another story. <laughs> Anyway, so what kept me into the in the group was that um, Jehovah's Witnesses have created a whole narrative about the world, and um, to leave that group would be to lose your entire sense of what is actually real, and what mattered, and also who I was in the world, and also all your relationships. So it's definitely not easy. It's not easy to get out. It definitely is something that keeps you in those bonds. Um, Eventually what brought me to leave was, as I mentioned, I went as a missionary to China and I became immersed for the first time in my life in first of all, another culture and another language because I learned Mandarin in order to preach, to try to convert people there. And also because our work was done underground in China because it was illegal, it was the first time I had been outside of my community. In a community like that, everything is very self-affirming. Everyone believes the same thing. And even if you have a doubt, when everyone else is telling you that that doubt is irrelevant, then you tend to just tamp it down. So being in this new environment and more on my own, more independent and sort of making relationships with people for the first time who weren't also Jehovah's Witnesses um, started to just make me slowly question the things that I had been raised with. Um, and it, it was just, it wasn't immediate. It wasn't like this epiphany happened, but slowly doubts started to creep in when I would interact with Bible students I was trying to teach my religion to here in China. I was this white woman coming here, you know, basically telling them that their thousands of years of history were sort of irrelevant and that my hundred year old religion was somehow uh, the truth uh, and superseded everything that they believed. And I started to realize how dumb that sounded and it made me question. And then ultimately another person I became close to began to challenge my faith and argue with me. And that actually really helped and eventually brought me to sort of wake up. Um, as far as the organization, the aspects of it that were destructive um, and life-giving, we thought about this talking earlier. And I think that what was most destructive in this group was teaching you that your life, this life is not the real life. We were taught that over and over again. And also the othering of people on the outside to create this distance or this separation between the chosen and the ones who would be destroyed, I felt was very destructive. And you were also kept emotionally hostage. This idea that you can't choose to leave your religion that you were born into because you find new information without losing everything you have and all the people in your life was very destructive. Um, and still there's repercussions for me to this day from that. 
And uh, the question of it being life-giving, I try not to be negative, but ultimately I think that the only life that this organization really offered was a fake life. It was a fantasy life, which in the end, I think was the most destructive thing of all. Well, thank you for sharing, Amber. All right, I'm gonna pass the mic over to Helen. Thank you. Hi, thanks so much, Natalia, for organizing this. and. Thanks to everyone for being here. My name is Helen Zuman. I spent five years at Zendik Farm. In I, I arrived there in 1999, stayed till 2004. Zendik Farm, I call it a neo-hippie cult because it came out of the back to the land movement, the counterculture, started in 1969 by a couple named Wolf and Errol Zendik out in California, moved a few times. When I arrived in 99, it was in the backwoods of Western North Carolina. Near Asheville, it was homestead, there was farming, there was art. How I got in, so when I graduated from Harvard, I received a fellowship to explore intentional communities that homesteaded, that farmed, that's what I was interested in, you know, all over North America. And I went to a couple of places, a few places over the summer, nothing really clicked for me. And then, and I found Zendik Farm, as I had found other communities, in a book called The Communities Directory, put out by the what's now called the, the Foundation for Intentional Community. And what attracted to me to Zendik in particular was they said that it was mostly young people there and I was fresh out of college and looking for you know belonging, that they did farming, but also art. And you know I wanted to learn skills that I had not learned in school, but I also wanted to continue my, my career as a, as a writer and artist. And they had structures for bringing people in. They had apprenticeships, they were looking for new people. Another couple things, they talked about something called the big lie. They said everyone in the outside world was lying all the time. I was at a point in my life where that rang true to me. I felt like I was living in the matrix. I had just graduated from this place where people were, my peers were going off to careers in banking and consulting and so on and kind of keeping the world eating machine going as I saw it. And I didn't, I didn't see a place for me, for what I cared about. So it was very attractive to believe that I wasn't screwed up, actually the whole culture was. So that's kind of what got me there. Then what got me to commit once I was there, part of it was, was the structures around dating. When I arrived, I was a virgin. I felt totally inept at the, at the mating and dating game. And Zendik had a structure for that. They had a third party system where if you were interested in someone, you would, ask a third party to quote, hit that person up for a walk or a date. And, and then you would get together with that person. So in a sense, this was very, very, you know, structured and controlling, but for me, it sounded great. It was, it was a way out of my, my ineptitude. Um, something else that kept me in was I had arrived with this grant money. I had spent very little of it. And about two weeks after I got there, I handed it over. So it was it was about $13,000. Part of why I did this was out of a desire to to know these people my entire life. You know, I I really I really had a very good impression of all the people I was meeting. They they all seemed very competent, rugged, good at farming, good at all kinds of things I had no idea about. There were plenty of hot guys, that was great too. So so I I really and they all seemed to know what they were doing and what life was about, and I didn't. So I, I wanted to be part of that. And, and I thought, well, maybe this is me, maybe this is it. Maybe I have found the place to be. I have found the people with the answers, you know, in the same way, well, I only applied to one college and I got in, well, maybe I'm right about this too. And then once I gave the money, of course, I didn't want to be wrong. Um, and once I was, you know, once I was, once I was in, then the story of Zendik kind of was very powerful in keeping me there. The story was we were creating a culture based on honesty and cooperation. We were gonna save the planet from lying and competition and ecocide. The outside world was the death culture. Those people were all lying all the time. You know, they were sending the planet over the cliff, over a cliff. So if I left, I would just be stuck with, you know, in that death culture. In terms of leaving, I, I was actually kicked out. I was exiled. This was fairly common at Zendik. It was kind of a way to 
remind those who remained that they had better work harder or that could happen to them. And also a way of making those who remained feel like they were more chosen because look, they had made it when these other people couldn't. And there were, there were sort of proximate causes having to do with not making enough money on selling trips, having to do with giving up on my dream of lasting love. Um, but in a way it was kind of like my lottery number had come up. As far as life giving and destroying, the number one thing that was life destroying was surrendering my self-trust and policing myself. I believed in thought crime. I would get very upset about anything, any idea I had that that was went against the leader. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I basically, I, I learned to look to Errol, the leader, for, for answers as to what was right and what was wrong. Um, and in a sense, yes, I, I didn't, I just didn't fully feel like myself. I, I negated the wisdom of my body. Um, there was though, there was a lot that was life-giving. I mean, one, one aspect was just living in a village you know, with like 60 people, we all had a job. We were all good at things. There was, you know, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. Also trying the variety of the sexual experience. That was, there was control involved, but there was also the chance to experiment and learn and create intimate relationships. Also a number of those relationships were cut off by the leader way before they were done. And that was very difficult. And, and then a lot that was life-giving happened after I left after I understood what Zendik really was, that it was a cult and started to compost the experience, I have found tremendous fertility in that process. I have learned a ton and many of my very dearest friends are my fellow Zendiks. Thank you, Helen. Thank you very much. Margaret, I'm gonna pass the mic over Thanks, to you. Thanks, Natalia. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so I'm speaking today about my experience with the Christian social movement, the Oxford Group, which came to birth in the late 1920s, changed its name in 1939 to Moral Rearmament, and now is known as of 2001 as Initiatives of Change. It grew out of the evangelical world of the early 1900s in the United States, which at the time was more representative of mainstream American Christianity than the word evangelical would be today. This circle included many who went overseas as missionaries to China and other countries. It included John Mott, the founder of the YMCA. So it was um, the origins of, or the streams that fed into this movement were kind of quite well known in Christianity in the United States. Frank Bookman, the founder of the Oxford Group, <clears throat> was initially interested in effective personal evangelism and then focused his life work on the question of how to connect personal transformation with social and international political problems. After World War II, with the name Moral Rearmament, the group concentrated on building new relationships among the countries that had been affected by the war. Its contribution, along with that of others, to the Franco-German reconciliation that assisted the foundation or creation of the European Union subsequently has been well documented. The organization also addressed post-World War II relationships between Japanese and Koreans and Japanese and Filipinos. It was active in bridge building efforts that attempted to smooth the way to decolonization in a number of countries and it has a long track record in contributing to better labor management relations and greater understanding in race and ethnic relations. How did I get involved? My grandparents became involved in the movement in 1933. My parents met and married within the movement and I was born and brought up entirely within it. At the age of 17, I abandoned a place reserved for me at Edinburgh University and devoted all my time to the movement until my departure when I was 35. It was a powerful world to grow up in. 
we lived our lives against a backdrop of global events, constant travel and collegial friendships with a host of people from many countries. I found this exhilarating and romantic. There really is nothing quite so glorious as working alongside others for a great cause. The axiom of absolute unselfishness that the movement proposed meant that teamwork was pretty good, though the movement certainly had its share of conflicts and schisms. All participants were expected to meditate daily, to write down and obey thoughts that came and to frame this meditation as a search for God's plan for themselves and the world. I was a natural searcher and believed this formulation of spirituality deserved the fullest possible exploration. But there were also negative aspects of the movement that held me in. The group proposed that if you want to see the world different, you must start with yourself. This implied to the young and naive, including the children growing up in the group, that the crises of the world would not get resolved unless ordinary people like us changed our ways and lived sacrificially. It was hard for me to consider any alternative life because I had been indoctrinated with the idea that the world would fall apart if people like me didn't put our lives on the line to save it. The call for absolute unselfishness succeeded in getting many of us to work ourselves to the bone. The movement taught me to belittle or suppress my own feelings. As I say in the book I have been writing about this, by the time I was 35, I could not feel myself in my own story. Our family never had a home of our own as I grew up, and we had lived in many cities and countries. As a result, I had grown up with no real sense of where I came from. I thus had no picture in my mind of where I would withdraw to if I were to depart. During my childhood, because my parents traveled so much and left me in the care of others, the organization itself functioned for me like a third parent. In my case, the third parent was far more predictable and present than my real parents. My real parents' absence deprived me of the necessary early childhood experiences associated with maturation. On top of this, my mother's depression and my father's insecurity caused me to feel some responsibility to fill the gaps in their lives. As I got older, I felt more and more that the best way to love my parents was to do better in the movement than they had been able to do in order to prove to them that their decision to pit their lives with this endeavor had been meaningful and legitimate. How did I leave? I experienced over time an increasing sense that nothing I was doing in the organization was leading me to a sense of satisfaction or a sense that I was on a good path. A medical crisis followed by extreme depression created for me a radical break with the way I had been living my life and allowed me to be serious about embarking on a different life. It was easily said that people worked for the movement voluntarily and nobody would stand in your way if you decided to leave. But the strongly disapproving comments about those who had departed and the tight codependent family system of the movement meant that particularly for a young person who'd grown up in it, it was hard to leave. That said, when I did finally decide to leave, nobody tried to stop me or persuade me to stay. I was fortunate that I had some family money. I knew that colleagues who might wish to do the same had much less financial freedom than I did. So as I see it, the most destructive aspect of the movement was that it had from the outset shunned leadership structures. So-called collective leadership opened the way to hidden hierarchies, opaque decision processes, and at times ugly power plays, often using moral shaming. The presence of large numbers from the same families and intermarriage led to an elaborate power network that took a lifetime to understand. Newcomers had a huge challenge in finding their way in this. Nobody was being paid, which meant that some people were surviving on very little while those who had already worked and saved or who had money from the family had far more financial freedom. There were no forums that invited true critical thinking and debate. The lack of intentional project development or hard nosed dis discussions of the purpose of any enterprise, the lack of clarity about job descriptions and the absence of mentorship led to vagueness about the value and results of any endeavor. 
uh, life-giving aspects. I think I've described some of them at the beginning, but I, I find myself saying that in spite of all of the above, there was and remained something remarkably compelling about participating in a loosely defined global community who are putting their shoulder to the wheel to nurture change makers in their cities and towns through friendship, through training programs, through joint undertakings, and with an undercurrent of spirituality. Thank you. Suki, I'll pass the mic to you. It's really hard to follow up on that. Come on, Margaret. <laughs> I'm just really going to blither through this and I apologize for everyone else who has to listen to my, you know, dithering through after Margaret's incredibly prosaic story. Um, so yeah, so I'm Suki. I'm really excited to be here with all of these incredibly wise and intelligent women. I am new to the cult exiting game, if, if one can be new to it. Uh, I sort of came in backwards to this organization than most people actually, even within the organization, come in. So I have like a, a bit of a strange entry. Um, I, before, before I even sort of get into my cult entrance, um, I had a really lovely upbringing. I grew up in Morocco. I grew up on a farm. I came to the States when I was seven, uh, barely spoke English and kind of like muddled my way through this language. And uh, we moved around uh, the country every few years. My, my, um, my family was very like uh, explore, exploratory with different uh, faiths, but also careers and jobs. And we really just sort of floated through the world experiencing different adventures. Uh, and I ended up landing in Brooklyn uh, after college and really was striving to become a filmmaker, uh, specifically in documentary and kind of working my way up the ladder. And I had sort of reached a, a particular period in my career where I was very burnt out. And I was kind of, I came in so doe-eyed and bright-eyed and naive to the world of production. And I went from sort of feeling like documentary was going to save the world um, to feeling like I was just stuck in these kind of grinding commercial jobs and kind of in this rut of uh, financially doing well for myself, but feeling very empty inside and, and very purposeless and very lonely. Even though I had lots of people around me, um, I just felt very um, purposeless um, and I didn't know what I was doing. And then I decided that in order to get my life together, I wanted to make a documentary about something that I was passionate about. And I was very interested in uh, sustainable agriculture. And so I decided that the best way to ignite my passion again for the craft was to make a film about a female urban farmer. And so I was kind of on the hunt and I uh, found a woman who was willing to speak with me. She was um, graceful and beautiful and kind and was a few years older and she was from Harlem and super cool. And I just really, uh, I just felt like immediately looked up to her and felt this connection to her. And she was the woman who um, pitched me DOS, which was this sort of uh, internal onion inside the onion of Nexium, like many layers deep. But I didn't know anything about Nexium. I didn't know what it was. There was no connection to the outside sort of onion of uh, personal growth classes that Nexium uh, purported to sell. Um, and I had had a familiarity with neurolinguistic programming, uh, which is really sort of a field of psychotherapy and communication that looks at the effectiveness of communication. Um, some people have used it uh, as pickup artists, but other people have used it really well in just different forms of psychotherapy to get through um, more challenging uh, internal conflicts. So I was familiar with the work when she started telling me about Nexium, but her first pitch was really uh, a pitch about uh, being a part of a, a global secret network similar to the uh, stonemasons or freemasons um and it was like this 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 community of powerful women that were going to um, change the world not publicly but sort of privately through this network of holding ourselves accountable to our goals our dreams um and not let, letting ourselves off the hook and sort of like creating this feminine um, society, the secret society of women. And I was kind of like, that's cool. Like, I want to, I want to be in on that. And there were obviously like all of the red flags. There are all these things that, you know, if you weren't already feeling 
pretty empty and purposeless that that maybe wouldn't appeal to you. And if you already had like a very entrenched social group that you felt really um, just connected to, I think it might have been different. But at the time, um, she also heard about a lot of my um, a lot of my challenges with female friendships in the past, female relationships, my own internal struggles with my career. And she very much tailored the pitch of the organization of DOS to my own weaknesses, to my own fears. Um, and, and this is indicative of how they sort of operate most of the organization is it is very personally tailored to each human that comes in. And it's sort of like, uh, it's an involvement and a commitment to working within this organization is a commitment to working on yourself. And so similar to Margaret's story, it was uh, founded on a belief that by, by working on yourself, you change the world. The world cannot be changed sort of from the outside as this big mass, but every person working on themselves will actually lead to a groundswell of change. Um, not really with any belief system around a God or what is, um, sort of like faith through the traditional aspects of religion. It was much more a, um, a, a belief system around principles and a belief system around ethics and holding ourselves accountable to those ethics and principles in a, in a very aggressive and strict way. But yet it was, it was for a principle, it was to uphold a principle in the world and strengthen that principle's existence. Um, and there was something that felt really powerful about that, even though there were a lot of red flags and we had to get through um, the, the, the early process of the thing that kept me inside was collateral. And um, collateral is so interesting because it's kind of like those memes you see, uh, like Pinterest memes of like what you think it's going to look like and what it actually is. And collateral was supposed to be this commitment to yourself. And it was a commitment to your own growth. It was a commitment to uh, your higher self, I think, in some ways, your more principled self, the one who wakes up and follows all of your promises. Um, and it was a commitment to being a better person in the world. Um, so that uh, that, that was sort of the positive motivator that ended up leading me to sort of stay there even in moments of doubt because there was something really powerful and noble about uh, offering myself just as a person, not even fighting to like, uh, not even fighting to push myself in the world and society through my career and career ambitions, but actually working to build something more powerful. Um, and with a community of people that were really cool and also very powerful in their own right. Um, I was working with and getting to know people who were, you know, multimillionaire CEOs of companies that, that ran um, companies you have heard of and uh, people who were consultants and were incredibly brilliant in their field and authors and actors. And uh, it was just a really inspiring environment I think to meet people in, especially if it's uh, a collective focused not on just getting more material goods in the world, but uh, building a better society, building a better world for us all to live in. Um, so of course, this was sort of the, the, the noble part of collateral, the noble part of the organization uh, is this mission-driven attitude and then the dark side, I mean, the, guy, the, the leader got 120 years in prison. And so it'll tell you a little bit about like the, the dark choices that he made um, in the head of the organization. But outside of just sort of those sal the salacious uh, details that many people have seen sort of in the media, the things that I found were the sort of the most destructive within this, very similar to the other women here, it um, was an architecture of power that purported to be one thing and was very different. Um, in practice, and the resource of power being something that was uh, claimed to be uh, democratized through this process of uh, in deep and intense self-critical, uh, self-criticism and also just interrogation of our own emotions, that we were building power, we were literally empowering ourselves, but uh, what we didn't realize or didn't want to look at for a really long time is how that uh, as we were empowering ourselves, we were giving up that power just as quickly um, to the, those who were higher up in the chain. Um, and I myself experienced it in a very intense way more than other people who joined Nexium because through DOS, it was a master-slave relationship with someone who was absolutely your, your 
the, the higher up and you had to do what they said. And so for me, that architecture of power was so clear that I literally was a pawn in somebody else's desires, whether it was good or bad. Um, I had to learn to quiet everything in me, all of my intuition, all of my uh, sense of self, similar to so many of the women here. Um, I just learned to shut down over and over and over again, these things that are the sort of the precious indicators of our own well-being and our own sense of safety and sense of belonging in this world. Um, I went from being uh, an, un, a kind of unhappy, but still like self-driven person to kind of performing this, um, this joy all of the time and eating very little and being on an incredibly strict diet, having to be accountable to somebody 24 hours a day. I had to be on call. Um, I was running errands for other people. I had to do acts of service. Um, and all of those things on one hand were really incredible. It was an incredible structure for discipline, but the consequences on the other side was this blackmail that you've created, which was collateral, uh, could be released at any time. Um, and you don't really have a choice. And also if you go against anything that we say, you are morally betraying yourself because that vow isn't to us, it's a vow to yourself. And so I think this sort of the overarching lessons that I experienced within my participation in Nexium was um, both uh, a very much a deepening of my sense of purpose in the world, a, a deepening of my understanding of how mission drives people and how the subconscious drives you, um, and a real sense of connection with people who were fighting for something similar. It's sort of like national, it's like the the dark side of. Uh, of a loyalty to a group of people that you're building something with, a building a society with. And the dark side was all of the ways that, um, that you take power away from yourself and you give power constantly and unendingly um, in a way that then you have nothing left and you are just merely a foot soldier. You are a shell of the person you once were um, and you're just giving and giving and giving, but you just don't know why anymore. Um, and so I think those are the larger, the larger pictures. And my exit was really because the organization imploded from the inside out. Like I met another woman, we shared our experiences and it was in the midst of Nexium completely on just breaking apart. And so um, it was because certain members spoke out and decided to get people out. So um, yeah, I think that, that those are sort of the big pieces of entry to exit and the things in between, but there's so much to explore. That's just sort of the larger larger picture. Um, yeah, and thanks, Margaret, for making that really hard for me. Really appreciate you for that. Thanks. Well, Suki, you weren't rambling at all, so don't worry about it. Um, and thank you for sharing. Thank you all so much for sharing. Um, these are such complex, complicated stories. And as, as everyone has mentioned, there are life-giving aspects, just as there are destructive aspects. And it's important to name both within a process of healing and of dismantling and experience. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you all again to our uh, audience members for being here. So I think we should, let's turn to some overarching themes that we've highlighted in our conversations together, both today, but also um, through our previous meetings um, around the uh, abuse of power in these kinds of organizations. So I would first like to bring up structures of accountability and structures of power within a group or lack thereof. Um, one of the fascinating points that Margaret has brought up is the capacity for any community really to exhibit, exhibit similar high control characteristics, toxic work situations, et cetera, um, similar to the groups that you've mentioned today. And the intention behind these organizations is usually to empower people, but there seems to be something off in the structures of accountability and power dynamics within these communities. Um, and so, those so-called checks and balances don't function uh, in a way to protect the community at large. And so I'm wondering if we could speak to that a little bit and um, uh, pass the mic over to Helen first. Thanks, yeah. So I would object to the terms of the question. I don't think that in cults, th there is an intention at the beginning to empower people and something is off. I would say, th this is my, my hypothesis, that 
the desire to control and have power over is in the DNA of the group. I believe that that was true at Zendik. It was started by a couple um, who originally controlled they, 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 they controlled the land. Um, they, they started out by gathering a bunch of other people around them and kind of setting the terms of engagement. When I, when I lived there, when I first arrived, there was uh, an articulated hierarchy. Each of us wore a wrist, wristband of a different color signifying our place in the hierarchy. The people at the top were called the family and they had purple wristbands. The, that hierarchy was officially dismantled about a year after I left. We had a big meeting with a big catharsis and ripped off our wristbands, but the but the pyramid stayed very firmly in place. And 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 when that when that happened, when the wristbands were done and and we were told now we're all equal, you all better stop complaining because you're all equally responsible. I knew that nothing had actually happened, that the pyramid was still there. And the pyramid was was kept in place uh, on the one hand, um, through through social structures, Errol would just scream at people, just eviscerate them in public, and then going down the pyramid, we did that to each other as well. And then there was the Panopticon. We were we believed in thought crime, although we didn't call it that, and we were watching each other all the time. However, underlying those structures of power, I would say, were two very basic things, very prosaic things. There was who, who controls the money and who owns the land. Errol and her family, Errol controlled the money and owned the land. When I arrived, I had money, I gave it away. That was a condition of membership. Eventually everyone had to do that or you were gonna be asked to leave. And so it wasn't easy for me to just head out, you know, when I felt like it. I'm gonna contrast Zendik to another organization that I am part of now called Earth Haven. It's an eco-village also in North Carolina. It's, a, it's an actual intentional community and not a cult. It was started in the mid nineties by a group of I think 12 different founders, all, all with different religious beliefs, all put the money, put up the money to buy the land and created a, a council structure of governance from the beginning. It, it, it's, it's in Earth Haven's DNA to to allow to, to, to allow people to cooperate and trust themselves and and have their own power. Fantastic answer. Thank you, Helen. It's really helpful to contrast the the what's really at the heart of the organizations. So thank you. Um, Margaret or Amber or Suki, is there anything you'd like to add or respond uh, to what Helen has has um, has given us, has offered? I'll just say a couple things uh, because I do think the group I was with was a little bit different. Uh, and so we have to be careful about our generalizations. Um, I think back in the 1930s, people had a much less well developed understanding of what empowerment of another individual actually was. Uh, and so they might have been kind of believing that they were helping people to grow in some way that nowadays, as we look at what they actually did, we would say they really didn't get it. Uh, so I don't think that they came in with a desire to control people, which it sounds like they did uh, in the situation that Helen was in. But I think that the when you don't have leadership structures or you haven't been insightful about thinking about the way a group dynamic is going to form that leadership leadership structures are there to actually take some control of that process because group dynamics otherwise can be quite harmful. So there was a sort of refusal to recognize that by deciding not to have leadership structures, you were lending yourself to some of the negative aspects of group dynamics, that th this was the problem. And I can recognize just because the purpose of this gathering is really, I think, to um, raise some red flags for newly developing groups that are coming along. And we live in an age that's increasingly democratized. Increasingly, we, we see these groups forming and they really want to be communal. They want to give everybody power and so on and so forth. Um, and so they might come in with the same kind of naivete that the people in the group I came from came into and thinking, we, you know, we don't want to have one big shot who's a leader here. 
Uh, we want to kind of make all our decisions together. But just understanding that some of the ideas about um, how you uh, create common governance are really important to think about as you start off with a group like this. Otherwise, it, it will actually create power structures that you don't like. I was also going to add that what I find really interesting is that the Jehovah's Witnesses started in the, like the late 1800s, I think it was, um, and they didn't have an, a hierarchy. Their whole goal was to be different and that everyone was equal and that we were sort of trying to find truth together. And what was really interesting is that sometimes I think I've noticed a pattern that the very survival of these groups as they grow, it starts to require an organization uh, in order to proselytize or to just keep things from you know falling into chaos and then what I've noticed happens is that the organization then takes over the humanity and then once 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 a group that started with good intentions so often these start with good intentions turns into this organizational machine it loses its humanistic qualities and that's why you can see with the Jehovah's Witnesses like it even if you look at the Jehovah's Witnesses 20 years ago versus today they become more and more extreme because the organization, needs that for its very survival. And I think that what I see is just a real problem in that um, when it shifts to that like kind of a bureaucratic structure, the compassion, the humanity, the, the whole vision falls apart and it becomes about the survival of the organization. And I, I will also jump in on that. Um, within Nexium, uh, there was a real intentionality in power structures. I mean, it was very clearly laid out the significance and importance of earning, like earning your keep, earning a status. I mean, they had a whole system of colors to sort of indicate based on what sashes you wore, um, what level, and it was a big deal when somebody got promoted and it would happen, you know, at like different celebrations, but there was a real, um, I think people really connected to a sense of that earning and that for them it actually meant more than a job promotion or meant more than a graduation because there was something tied to their morality about it. And I don't think that that's necessarily, um, I, I think there's some things that are um, mostly dangerous in not like having accountability uh, from in a chain all the way up until the very top. And at the very top, if there is no accountability uh, and a check and balance for the person who's at the top of the pyramid, you're basically just relying on someone's capacity to handle power. And we know power corrupts and whether that's something that is inherent to that person and their desire to control and govern, um, which like tends to be the nature of people who want to lead a large organization, um, or if it's somebody who doesn't have that inherent nature, but still can be corrupted by the nature of being able to have so much power and not and no consequences for whatever you do. And so I think like with now we're seeing it within organizations um, like ombudsmen and people who are essentially outside of the organization that provide a kind of check and balance for those who are leaders. It's not flawless, but I do think that creating um, just putting just as much energy into constructing checks and balances for those who are at the very top of the pyramid as is created for the soldiers essentially all the way up. It's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you all. It's, yeah, those in insights are really important. <laughs> Thank you. So our next question, um, which has to do also, I think, with some of the questions um, that are popping up in our Q&A feature, has to do with tools for deconstructing your experience um, and how to process that exit and how to process moving on with your life. Um, and Amber, I think, let's go ahead and start with you if you're comfortable with that. Sure, yeah. I, I think that in my case, I had never known a life outside this organization, which is different than maybe some of the others here. And so for me, um, it was just so disorienting to leave the group. I got to the point where I knew I couldn't stay in it anymore because I realized how much was wrong. But I also still had these residual beliefs and fears that had been ingrained in me. Um, and the other thing was that I didn't know how to live in the real world. Like Jehovah's Witnesses live in the world, but they live in their own world within the world. It's like you don't really fully participate in the world. And I didn't really understand the culture. And someone I know is doing research about this and how you're almost like a refugee in the sense that you are completely thrown out of an environment where you've built a light and 
and, and you don't understand this new world that you're going into and you have to completely start over again. And so um, for me, that kind of resonated in a sense because I felt like I was still living in the same place, but didn't know like exactly how people lived. So one thing that I think first of all helped was that I read a book by Alexandra Stein who uh, recently, who talks about, she's an expert in um, cults and she talks about how one of the foremost ways that people can get out, especially if they were raised in a group like this is to have a close relationship with someone on the outside. Like you need to have someone you can trust because people would tell me things are wrong with the Josephs all the time. And I, it doesn't enter because I don't, I've been told that that's all lies, but I slowly developed a relationship with someone who slowly got through. And because I trusted him, I would let it sink in just a little. So that was a real first step, but that was just the beginning because I still was scared that Armageddon was coming. I mean, literally up until probably five years ago, I, bet I got out in like 2008, 2007. I would, I, I feel like I was totally over it but then I would hear like a thunderstorm and the first thought would be like oh my god it's Armageddon they were right <laughs> you know it's like it's still wired in your brain so I had to get rid of that fear and what I did was I just embarked on a program of just learning and reading and I enrolled in college because we weren't allowed to go to college and I just started to see how much bigger the story of the world was than what I had been taught and for me the biggest thing that got those structure like that made them dissolve eventually and loosed the hold on me was because I just took in enough knowledge where what happened over the years was that the Jehovah's Witness world, which had been the entire world, slowly shrunk into in insignificance because I realized there had been so much data and so much information and so much that I hadn't, had no clue even existed. And thus it makes sense why they don't really let you go to college because you probably would leave if you did. Um, so that was really important, just learning. And then the other thing was to form friendships with people who were normal people of course almost all my friends are weird so I won't say normal but who people who were not from my background in a way was really helpful because it would make the things that I thought or said sometimes would come out so jarring like I could sense it because I could pick it up that it slowly taught me like how bizarre what I believed really was and and I had a therapist once I remember this was very therapeutic for me I was sitting in her office and she I, I was telling her you know I this is early on I, I have this fear that I'm going to die that Armageddon's coming and she burst out laughing and then she was horrified she was like that is so unprofessional I cannot believe I really apologize to you for laughing but the laughing actually helped me because it just made me realize how ridiculous it was so for me that was the things that helped me sort of lose the hold that those beliefs had on me thank you I love the power of laughter in those moments it's wonderful as a tool for deconstruction Margaret or Suki or Helen, do you have anything to add? Um, I, I do. So when I left Gendic, I was still a true believer. I was kicked out. So I just thought, well, I've just lost everything. I had a little bit of a, a, of a spark of excitement because for the first time in a long time, I was going to be able to, to eat and sleep and do as I pleased without the eyes on me, without everyone watching and, and judging. So there was a little spark of excitement, but mostly I just felt utterly devastated. However, I was told to leave, so I did. And it, it actually took me more than a year to get the cult memo. So I had my physical departure, happened in September, 2004. My mental emotional departure didn't really happen until early December of the next year. It was, in a way, it was gradually happening that entire time because since I was out in the in the so-called death culture, I did have to rely on other people, you know, for, you know, food and shelter and warmth and companionship. And so to a degree, I did start letting people in and I did, I did notice that they actually treated me better than the average Zendik, but I still carried this story that I had failed and that I was doomed unless I returned. However, about a year after I left, I actually hitchhiked out to California from West Virginia and traveled around the world, came back to New York, finally got a chance to relax and started just like thinking and writing and, and like allowing myself to have questions. And one thought that really helped me was the idea that the universe is vast in this universe that is so vast, it is not possible that there are only two choices, go back to Zendik or be doomed. 
So, so there were cracks appearing in my Zendik armor. And then I had a watershed conversation with a friend who'd also lived at the farm and left after I had. She had gotten the cult memo and we had this incredible conversation one night in which we simply retold the story of Zendik, changing the premise from we are screwed up people because we didn't make it there to actually we're fine, it was a screwed up place. And then after that, as soon as I got the cult memo, I decided I'm going to write a book about this. I think, you know, I had always been kind of a frustrated writer and this was just like, okay, now you have to do this. And certainly the writing process helped me compost the experience. I also started writing about it on the internet. And this is interesting in relation to the idea of accountability because when I lived at Zendik, I never disagreed with Errol. I never said, Errol, you're wrong. After I left and got the cult memo, I started writing on the internet about Zendik as a cult. And I write, wrote an FAQ about Zendik and so on, which became kind of the go-to source of information for people, for people who wanted to know about Zendik beyond the party line. So I kind of became a source of accountability for Errol after I left. And, and I, I was told years later, I did actually have a role in making life a lot more difficult for them. But, but that, that was really important for me in terms of, I, I went through a period of intense anger and I went ahead and allowed myself to be angry. And, you know, then over time, especially through writing and conversing with fellow exendics, I got to the point of asking what my soul was up to in this whole experience and what I was looking for and what I got and didn't get and kind of integrating the experience into the whole arc of my life making myself the protagonist of my own story. Yeah, that's powerful. The protagonist in your own story is, it seems to be uh, a theme <laughs> through, through all of the experiences that you've shared today. In the interest of time, I'm gonna move on to the next question on commentary and assumptions you've encountered since leaving the organization with, which goes along with what Helen was saying about becoming a source of accountability uh, after exiting the group. Um, and Suki, I'm gonna pass the mic over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm actually gonna blend the two questions because I think they really speak to each other for my experience. Um, so I left Nexium, like, and a month later, I met the filmmakers of The Vow. It was like, and like maybe a few months later, uh, I was also part of an article that came out um, in the New York Times, and it went very immediately from, like, I was still processing my experience, and I immediately had to go into storying it. Like, I went fr directly from experiencing the thing, trying to come to terms with it, not knowing what just happened, being very much in a state of shock uh, to having to frame it in a way that could be both digestible to people. Um, and I had a sense of uh, essentially like a, a, a sense of responsibility. My story, my experience was filtered through uh, this feeling of responsibility I had to two groups of people. One, it was the people who were still inside Nexium, who did not actually know what was going on and what happened. These, these are my community members, my friends, who they also didn't know what was going on with DAS. And so many different narratives and stories were flying within the organization of like what was happening, who was responsible, what was actually true. Um, so I had this, I felt the sense of responsibility to truth to them, to the people who didn't know what was going on and were being told sort of different versions of my experience and um, a responsibility for people on the outside to understand what was happening because in the media, I don't know if you guys remember, it was like sex cult everywhere. <laughs> and I was like, oh, like how, how do you process something where you haven't even, you're barely just getting to the place where you can call it um, a high control group. And sometimes putting a label on it, sure it helps, but then you just feel like you feel the stigmas, you feel all those things which I'm gonna lead into like sort of the public opinion or the perception of it is, um, it's just really salacious and it really feeds in, I think, to our like soap operatic desire to learn more about these high control groups where like you've given up your authority, but also it's sexy and also it's dangerous and it's just like a crime thriller. And so you have this sort of public hunger um, and it, I was I think we all have it, but it's there's this very intense when there's like kind of a media explosion about these sort of cults, whether it was like wild wild country or especially sort of Nexium. There's this real 
hunger for the salacious, dirty details and the people who actually I have found in my personal experience, the people who have been the most traumatized are the ones that um, are un more unwilling to put things into a black and white frame of bad and good. And I was traumatized and I, you know, it's there, there's, well, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to change that. Uh, depending on what people's experiences with the public, I think there is a, there are a trajectory in which those who have been really badly hurt become um, deeply motivated to take down the, the sources of pain, take down the organization structure that caused the pain, which I think is like a powerful instinct and a powerful motive. And I felt that motive to sort of bring justice, create some sense of balance. But I also had this other side of me, which was an understanding of the nuance and an kind of an internal inability to say it was all bad or it was all good. But the public's opinion of many of these situations is that it is all bad, all good. They want it to be all bad. They want to know all of the worst things about it. And so um, I think something that I've just been processing so much in my time, sort of post media explosion, post experiences with the documentary, um, is in what ways is like telling your story uh, helpful and like generative and nourishing? And in what ways does it, does it become re-traumatizing because you're sort of storying your experience in a way that is filtered through other eyes? So sort of like we see this in the Black Lives Matter movement, like the sort of like black narratives being filtered through this gaze of whiteness or, or feminist narratives of like women wanting to tell their stories, but it's filtered through the male gaze. And like, I think that cult narratives, like ex members experiences are really unique. And even within this group, we, we have such different relationships to the organizations and our experiences. And yet it is funneled through this filter gaze of like cult member. And it's just, you feel like you're cramming yourself into this box, which is helpful for people to understand, but it's also can be like very damaging to even processing your own experience because it doesn't leave a lot of room for gray. Um, and so I think in the spirit of just wrapping everything up, um, I think that the assumptions I've encountered since leaving the organization have varied widely, but the biggest one is that um, the story was simple uh, instead of it was complicated and it was nuanced and it was challenging. And I went through waves of accepting it, hating it, loving it, crying over it. And, um, and that people want you to sort of be like the victim. And like, what if you're not? What if you are just, you have suffered at the hands of controlling mechanisms and abuses of power, but you're not like a victim. You are, you are just a human who has gone through them and your experiences of them are very, very um, unique to you. Uh, yeah, so I think that's that's all I'll say about that. If anyone else wants to chime in. Thank you, Suki. Um, speaking to the particularities of each experience, I think is very important. Um, and the nuances and the ambiguities, it is, as we mentioned at the beginning, it's a delicate balancing act of talking about these experiences. So. Thank you for sharing. And I think that fits in really well with our last question, which I'm gonna to pass to Margaret, which is on who was able to break through feelings of isolation after leaving the organization and how did they approach um, connecting with you in a way that was different or more effective uh, than some other commentary that was further isolating? Um, yeah, I wanted to just say a couple of things that it, just to sort of point out or clarify what strikes me as I've listened to the last few comments is that you walk away from this world that you've been so embroiled in and possibly spent your entire life in. The first thing is to create some place to stand. Um, and that is perhaps, you know, going to be all consuming at the beginning or, or at some level has to be, but all the time underneath you're asking yourself what would have just happened to me. And, and so, but anyway, creating a place to stand and then acquiring some life experiences that you've really missed out on, um, that things that would have been normal for other people that you really haven't had. And, and so all of that is necessary to kind of gradually create a different sense of yourself in the world. And so that is another thing that's going on. And then thirdly, this thing of how to create connection with others 
and and sort of this question of how to how much to even talk about the world you came out of or is that actually going to sort of deep six any possibility of a relationship with the person that you have in front of you and um so i must say that of course the people i look back to who were the most important to me were the ones who assured me of a of a kind of friendship that went beyond superficialities so you know i think we live in a country where people talk a lot about relationships and about the need to protect themselves and so many people are kind of okay about talking to somebody who's a stranger who has a strange friendship and they listen but then they walk away and they seem not to actually develop any real traction in the relationship and and so people who would actually invite me to their home consistently over a period of five years you know that that was different that that signaled to me somebody who actually liked my company who liked listening to what i had to say who who saw me as a person that they really wanted to have as a friend uh and you know there were three or four people like that over time but it took time i would say for the first three or four years i didn't find anybody like that at all um then i also had this experience with the with the psychotherapist and i i should say i didn't even go to therapy for the first several years but then i did um but again i experienced psychotherapy as a problem because again i felt there was this kind of mask or this self protection thing going on from the therapist uh which was actually not breaking through me my self protection but i felt that there was one moment when a when a psychotherapist actually cried at something i said and it it made me recognize that actually she felt this almost more deeply than i did and so it it was a jolt into a different uh, emotional state i think that's all i'll say i think it's interesting that yours cried and mine laughed <laughs> <laughs> but it both helped right. yeah mine laughed too and it definitely helped <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I love the complexity of those reactions. That's amazing. All right, we're going to move into our Q&A with our um audience members. Thank you so much for those of you who've submitted questions just due to the amount of time that we have. We're meant to end in about 10 minutes. Um we're going to limit the questions that we're able to answer today. Um so The first question that we're going to respond to is from Helen Berger and she asked all of your stories are all so gripping and describe well high control groups and the many ways in which they control those who are members. My question is why use the term cult? I have a problem with it and I wonder if it adds to your thinking or analysis. Those who study marginal religions have written extensively about the problem with this term. So I'm wondering um <laughs> passing it over to you how do you feel about that how how do why is that term so important in the way that you describe your experience can i can i can speak to that when i learned about the cult pattern and i i would define a cult you know bullet point as an interlocking set of patterns that that combine to strip the individual of self trust when i got the cult memo and i learned about this set of patterns and i saw that zendik was not unique but fit this pattern that was incredibly tremendously freeing so i am absolutely grateful to the word cult also the word cult is usually defined by association association with you know waco jonestown whatever and that's a problem because it encourages people to cast the cultists or the ex cultists out of the ring of human understanding in that way the term is is very problematic but as something that has that has freed me from my old story of zendik as revolution i i find it incredibly useful um and also i think it is useful to have a word that signals warning calling the group a cult is shorthand for no i wouldn't advise you to go there if the group is still extant and no overall it was it was not a healthy place not that it was all bad obviously but i think as a person who was in a cult i don't regret the experience but i wouldn't repeat it and it is useful to be able to signal that with one word 
I just want to jump in real quick, real quick. Um, it's just, uh, so in that, I really love your definition. And I want to say that it really has felt to me like it kind of depends on who you are, if it's helpful. Like if it's a term that is helpful for you, then it's so generative because like Helen said, it is identifying a pattern and being able to recognize you're not alone. It's like for certain people, diagnosis for mental health is like very helpful because it helps them identify with like a larger pattern and not be so judge, not judge themselves so intensely. It can also be used as a crutch. So I think in that sense, and I will say that with Nexium, we used it all the time to like make fun of people's judgments of Nexium. And so I think it can also be weaponized within the organization to make it like, oh, it's so funny. They think we're in a cult, but we're like in a cult of positivity. So I think that it, it, for, for that reason, for me, it actually didn't mean anything because the organization itself stripped that word of meaning so that once I left, it didn't, it, I didn't really have anything to grasp onto. Um, and even in my understanding of cults, I was very reticent to use the word for a while because it had kind of been the meaning itself had been changed and manipulated within the organization. So I agree and I love I agree that like it can cast someone outside the realm of human understanding. I love that framing. I also think if it's helpful for people to identify those patterns, it's really wonderful. Thank you, Suki, and thank you, Helen. Our second question comes from Jennifer. Knowing what you know now, would each speaker give a question one should ask an organization if one is thinking of becoming involved? And uh, with that organization, like what kind of information should that organization offer to make a discerned choice? I would say that you can't really trust the answer you get from that organization necessarily because I think about the Jehovah's Witnesses and I know that if you ask that question they would be like oh yes you can leave anytime it's your choice but what you probably should do is talk to people who have left and ask what their experience is because um, anything can be kind of painted in a certain way but you're not necessarily going to be given all the information up front you have to do I think external research. So I would say if it's a if it's a group of people living together, the question to ask is who controls the money and who owns the land. Excellent, good responses. Suki or Margaret, do you have anything to add to that? I would just ask how how the community is organized, how the leadership structure works, uh, issues around money, uh, also around decisions about people's actual work experience and mentorship and what am I actually going to be doing here and how is that work going to be judged? Um, all, all sorts of questions around that. I suppose coming into this, of course, one of the problems for many people coming is they are a bit naive about how power actually functions and hidden forms of power. One thing that, of course, Helen has mentioned a lot, but hasn't come up generally, is how sexuality is handled in the group. I guess the Suki went to that too, but but that very often is a category that needs to be explored in a group like this. Uh, certainly, money and certainly leadership. And I, I feel like um, I'm also I tend to be less trusting of like external barometers, only because sort of like okay, well. It looks like a duck, acts like a duck, it's probably a duck. But in terms of the real signs for me, it feels more like an internal orientation towards somebody else having the answer. So I think, yes, you can look from the outside and see the ways that power is organized, but I would say probably the biggest indicator is if you speak to somebody who is a member of that organization and you sort of ask them like, okay, well, how are decisions made? And like, how do you know what to do and what is good and what is bad? Like who decides? And if that orientation is not centered within oneself, but is actually turned towards an external, either whether it's one person or a few people that have the answer, that for me is the biggest sign that that there's a, there's a dynamic difference uh, because you're basically just being trained to seek authority uh, from, from someone other than yourself, from somewhere other than your in, own internal compass. But that requires sort of speaking to someone about it and having a human relationship, which is ideally what we're trying to do is build these sort of subjective human connections with people on the inside versus just objectifying like, oh, how do you identify a cult from the outside? You could also just talk to someone and figure out where where is their orientation of authority um, and how do they see power within the organization? 
Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Our next question is from Caroline. Um, those of you who have written or are writing or creating a public statement of some sort about your experience, could you talk about your process of choosing how to present your stories? And Suki, I think also in relation to the documentary um, that has a lot of problematic aspects to the way that they uh, interacted with their subjects. I, you know, how do we read, how do we, how is, Somewhat, how, how do you find empowerment again in the ability to tell your story and um, how, did, how did that process come about? I can speak to that. When I first wrote my, the story that became my book, it was, just, it was just a long chain of everything that had happened to me that was emotionally resident. And there was a shade of, oh my God, you wouldn't believe what happened to me. And then in the, over the next 12 years, it took me to complete the book. It, 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 it became, it, it, it turned more in the direction again of what I was up to and, and my choices and how I, how I moved the story forward. And at some point along the way, I came across a maxim from a, a writing teacher. She said that the job of the memoirist is to tell the whole truth with love. And I took on that mission to make sure that as I was telling my story, I was not making anyone appear worse or better than they actually were, any, anyone including me, and to really do my best to understand, to understand Errol, where she was coming from, and yes, to, to tell the whole truth with love. Yeah, that's, that's well put, thank you. Nice. Amber and Margaret, you've both um, written quite a bit about your experience as well. And um, Margaret, you still work in a space where you're dealing with trauma and healing. And I'm wondering how that, uh, this process has impacted the way that you, um, that you present. Thank you. I could say that for me, um, when I started writing my memoir about this, um, it was kind of interesting because I had always felt like there was this divide in my life of the before and the after. And literally no one who knows me since 2008 is anyone that knew me before 2008. And I'm a really sentimental person and I found that really hard. And it was all, I felt like the same person. It wasn't like I felt like my identity completely changed. I kind of in fact felt like I was a better non-Jehovah's Witness than Witness. Like maybe I had found what I was always meant to be like an apostate, I don't know, it was just better for me. But um, there was this, disconnect that felt uncomfortable and kind of traumatic. And I didn't really think about it much until, so when I started to write the book and I started to revisit all that stuff, it, it almost felt like this way where I was able to like bring back my history and incorporate it into my life now. And in a sense, it was very healing for me. Um, and then of course, what happens after you write a book like that is that suddenly, especially because there haven't been many books by Joe's Witnesses who have left, suddenly um, I just heard for from thousands of people and apologies to everyone in the world that I never yet wrote back. But you realize that, that those people would write me and say, I feel so much less alone to have read your story. It was like as if I was reading my own story, but I also felt less alone. And so it, in a way that was um, a sort of a byproduct of those things that I just hadn't expected would happen from writing about the experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just quickly say that, that um, as I embarked on writing the book, perhaps the thing that I thought was the, going to be the most difficult was that this world I lived in was so very particular. And I wasn't sure that this would resonate with other people. And so I was wondering how you do that. And, and I, as I went along, I realized that in fact, my story is, and the same with Helen's story or Amber's story, Suki's story, is that it says something about the human condition. And this, this thing about a cult is, is a specialized word and I understand the, the point of using it and I understand points about in some situations being careful about the way it's used. Um, but the real point is that group dynamics are there and the, the tendency to give power to other people uh, is there and all these things are, are, are part of what it, it is to be human. And so, our story speaks as, as all good stories do to something very particular and also very universal. Uh, but certainly being on this panel has been remarkable because here we are talking with, each of us is talking with three other people who had similar but 
also in some ways dramatically different experiences, but a lot of similar themes have emerged. And so that is another thing that, that is reassuring as we go forward to tell the story. And I'll just say one thing to that. Um, when I left, the biggest struggle for me was um, not in some ways giving the authority of telling my story to other people also. Like I continued the theme of giving up authority to someone else and saying like, oh, you want to tell my story, you probably know better. And so kind of giving up that power and that authority also. And the last few years uh, for me have really been about um, re-empowering myself to tell the story that I want to tell from my perspective, whether that's autobiographical in a book or whether it's like a screenplay for something that's fictionalized and it's different and I get to like play with all of these different characters. Um, I feel like the most important and healing part of uh, the story is sort of owning it for yourself and doing it for yourself that it's coming from you, not being authored by others. And I, I believe that that is like, if it is governed, owned, designed and driven by you, then that is the most important thing. That like there's a personal claiming of that that version of things, not for anyone else and not out of a sense of responsibility to changing anyone's mind or to doing it for other people, but for oneself, um, that is so life-giving and nourishing. Um, and I'm so, it's so wonderful, similar to Margaret, I'm just so amazed at the ability that, the ability we have once we do own that story to come to a table like this and communicate that with one another. Um, it's so, it's so inspiring. So thank you, Natalia, for putting this together. Very welcome. Thank you all so much for being a part of it. Um, we are out of time and I want to be mindful of uh, everyone's very busy days and busy schedules these days. Um, so I want to thank you again so much to our panelists for joining us today and for sharing your complex stories. And thank you to the CSWR for co-sponsoring the event. Thank you to our audience. I apologize for the questions that we weren't able to answer. Please feel, feel free to reach out to me at PES, PES at hds.harvard.edu if you have any follow-up questions. We encourage you to subscribe to the Program for the Evolution of Spirituality's newsletter for upcoming events, including our inaugural conference on ecological spiritualities in April 2022. You can find more information on our website. And finally, again, if you or someone you know has been adversely affected by high control groups or organizations like those discussed today, we encourage you to visit the International Cultic Studies Association's website for support and counseling resources. Additionally, Helen has kindly suggested Stephen Hassan's books, Combating Cult Mind Control and Releasing the Bonds as additional resources. Thank you all again so much wishing you health and safety and warmth throughout the rest of the semester and we'll see you next time. <laughs>